Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, let's start with the name. I totally agree with you. You keep it. It's a global brand. But is that why you persist in having that logo that I think puzzles more people than the name? Um, the, the logo, again, we are part of an organization. Al Jazeera Media Networks is a big organization. And every channel in Al Jazeera has that logo. And again, giving up the logo would make us different from, from our sister channels. So that, that's another non-starter. Tell everybody here what Al Jazeera means. Oh, Al Jazeera. I was going to make a joke and say something horrible, but no. Al Jazeera <laughs> uh, means the peninsula because the government of Qatar owns Al Jazeera and Qatar is a peninsula. So that's what it means. It's not Al Qaeda. It's not a terrorist. Thank you for clearing that up. I, uh, uh, along the lines of this quest for an audience, there's a great rule in economics called Gresham's Law of Currency, which is the cheap drives the deer out of circulation, use paper money, put the gold under your pillow. I think there's a corollary to that in news, and namely all the cheap coverage has driven the great coverage underground. You're fighting that current. But if you look at this room, the reason I think, in, in spite of your considerable personal charm, <laughs> is that this is the audience that really, really cares about serious news. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have a record audience in this room. So how do you win the people who want the equivalent of slow food, meaning real news without being peppered by graphics? That's what you're doing, and it's great to, to those of us who have watched it. But when you break a great story, how are you convincing other media to pick it up and create a media ripple effect? Well, there were a couple of questions in there. So. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, when we break a great story, we do our best to make sure others are, are putting it out there uh, with our attribution. Um, we have actually, we have a, uh, um, a, an interesting thing that we've noticed, how many stories that we've broken, uh, or just interesting stories, or not necessarily hard news breaking stories, that have been on our website and on our, our TV that we have seen elsewhere essentially copied from us in very high quality news organizations. Um, we will get to a point where they're going to have to uh, attribute them to us. Right now, it's catch as catch can. Um, how do we get an audience that is going to look at us given that we're doing serious straight news? I think there's an audience out there. I mean, we, first of all, because of all of you, people do want news. There are more news watchers and news consumers now than there ever were before. And they come in you know, a variety of, of shapes and sizes. People who watch TV, people who go online, people who want to see things on their smartphones, people who get texted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we're trying to cover all those bases, but by giving the content that we don't think anyone else is doing. Honest to God, I look out there at what people call the competition, and I don't call it my competition. Technically, yes, 24-hour news channels are competition for us, but they're not competition because they're not doing anything like what we're doing. And for perfectly valid reasons in some cases. They have shareholders that they are beholden to. They have to do the most with the least amount of money. They have to make um, a profit. We are blessed in that right now, it's not like this is a a uh, a charity. We are seeking to make a profit, but we know that right now we have a, a nice long leash to get ourselves established, doing the right things because we firmly believe what we are doing will bring eyeballs. And we have tested and tested and tested and research and research and research, and we think that that research is supports that. Okay, I know there are lots of questions. Um, is there a mic that's floating around, or is this the one that yeah, floats? <laughs> okay, so I, as I hand this off, you can answer this quickly, because this mic has been restored, apparently. Um, and that is, if this uh, crowd here could convince President Obama to uh, cede Crimea to President Putin, do you think he could also ask President Putin to call the Egyptians and say, let go of those Al Jazeera people? 
Or in the alternative, could we get Jay Willard Marriott to say, I'm giving him frequent flyer points for every day there <laughs> in, um, in prison, cell, in, yeah. in the Marriott cell, yeah, doing this free publicity. Um, and then we'll get questions. Oh, there, there have been, Wait, okay, um, you can take that away. There are all sorts of um, conversations going on at various levels with various people about the incarcerated journalists. Yeah. I'm just going to take this out. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, I'll be on this side now. Hello. Um, there are lots of conversations going on about uh, I, at all levels, behind the scenes, in all places about our incarcerated journalists. So I, and I know the White House is aware of it. You know, I, I am privy to a lot of those things, and I obviously can't share them, um, and I'm sure there are things that I'm not privy to. Um, we're doing everything we can in every way we can. Anybody who's got good ideas, let me know. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I have a good friend who's a former foreign producer for NBC News who only watches Al Jazeera and is always singing your praises. However, it's for many of us, thinking that your, a lot of your funding comes from Qatar, and um, it's, it's very easy to say you're objective. Everybody starts out saying they're objective. We all look at various newspapers that are sub objective, and we know the minute we pick them up what their orientation is. And I guess I still need to be sold on this aspect. Well, the objectivity, the editorial um, decisions that are made at Al Jazeera are my, ultimately my decisions. And so to convince you, I'm going to have to convince you that I'm telling the truth. And I assure you that I am. Um, I would not have taken the job and left a great institution like ABC News uh, had I not had full editorial control of what's going on on the channel. Um, I can tell you, and this is the God's honest truth, that no one from Qatar has ever called me to talk to me about putting something on, has ever called me about something that we have put on, has ever told me not to put something on. Uh, and we have done pieces both online and, and um, on television that weren't necessarily um, favorable to the Qataris. Uh, there have been stories about the, the workers uh, who are building the World Cup stadiums uh, in Qatar and, and frankly, their intent, indentured servitude. And we've done stories about that. Um, I, I don't know how to say it more clearly, except, well, I'll tell you a, a story. My, my boss, who is the acting CEO, is a gentleman named Ihab al-Shihabi, who's a, a, a brilliant um, businessman. Um, he is not Qatari, he's Jordanian, but he had worked for Al Jazeera for a long time. When, months and months and months and months ago, you know, not soon after we launched, the story of the of the people who were building the, the stadiums in Qatar came up. Um, I uh, kept thinking, oh, I really should tell him in case anybody asks him what you know why we're doing the story. And I kept forgetting. It's I've a very busy life, and you know, day would go by. Oh God, I really should tell him. And two days later, I finally remembered. At nine o'clock at night, we were out at a business meeting, and he said, oh, okay. And that was it. That was the end. And since then, I had I don't even tell him. Um, so back to the editorial independence of the place, it is, I mean, I, I don't know how to say it any more clearly. Um, if, the, if there's anything wrong with the editorial, since it all rolls up to me, it's my fault. And if anyone, and I think everybody knows this within the place, if, if I ever get any pressure to do something one way or another, I walk. That's just the way it is. I, I can't work in that kind of environment. Uh, excuse me, um, my name is Ann Royfe, and I'd like to get to a specific here. Uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about the coverage of Israel, which is what makes me most nervous about the name Al Jazeera, and I'm sure that you can make me feel better or worse uh, <laughs> somehow. Thank you. Right, I hope I don't make you feel worse. Um, we have, at the moment, we have uh, one international bureau, and that's in, in Jerusalem. We plan to have more. But for right now, we have one. And uh, I purposefully chose to have our bureau in our first international bureau in Jerusalem uh, because I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we were going to be covering stories um, as um, uh, straight down the line as we possibly could. 
Um, our, our reporter is someone I poached from ABC News. He's a fabulous reporter named Nick Schifrin. And his job, as, I, you know, as we sent him off to, to go, uh, was to get to know every possible thing about Israel and the government and you know, inside and sources and tell that story. Because Al Jazeera doesn't suffer from a lack of people in, in the other Arab, in the other countries in the Middle East. But we want to make sure that we had someone who was absolutely covering Israel for us. Now, by the way, Al Jazeera Arabic has a, has a reporter in Israel, and Al Jazeera English has a reporter in Israel. There are a lot of Al Jazeera people in Israel. Um, I th think if you have looked at our, at our um, content, you'll see that, again, we tell all sides of stories. We don't stick on one side at the expense of the other. So if you have specific examples of things that you think that we have been slanted one way or the other, I would love to hear them because that's not what we're trying to do. Back here, Kate. We have, Hi, wait, Kate. We have somebody with a mic back here. Yes, somebody my, has name a mic is, back here. my name is Susan Heller Anderson, and as a female, I want to ask you, I believe that Qatar does not have women's suffrage, and how does that help you or hinder you in reporting on individual and civil rights? Um, again, our editorial for this channel is our own editorial for this channel. We report on everything that we think is right to report on. You know, there are lots of things that are not um, part of Qatar as a country that have no bearing on, on what we, re we report. I'm, I'm, I'm following the mic, so. I'm my way. Yeah. Oh, okay. I had a question, but Kate answered it. But let me just tell you what my introduction was to tell you that I can attest as a watcher of Al Jazeera, and recently, as I told you beforehand, as a participant on Al Jazeera, that everything you say is true about the balance, and that's, a, that's the wrong word to use, but you know what I mean, the fairness of your, of your coverage. I also had the experience recently I was going to ask you about, but you've answered that question also. After I appeared on Al Jazeera and I told a group of friends I had done that, they all winced. Uh, they were all over 35 years old. <laughs> well, do what I do, which is turn their TV on to Channel 57 and then see if they still win. I'm, I'm, let me, that was Warren Hogue, for those of you who don't know who that was. So please identify yourselves when you ask questions. Okay, Tom Claude Erbson, a retired AP executive. You mentioned that you have basically three different bureaus in Israel, the English, the Arabic, and America. Mm -hmm. From an economics and a management standpoint, that's something that would, does make a whole lot of sense. From a news standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Is there any cooperation between the three? Do you, you, do you exchange footage? Do you exchange, uh, yeah. just how, how do they work together? Well, they work together the way Al Jazeera English and frankly, all the Al Jazeera media networks work together. We put on, uh, we share, you know, raw video, we, we will put on, Al Jazeera America will put on pieces from Al Jazeera English from places where we don't have correspondence. I mean, we, much of our fabulous international coverage is because we have the advantage of having Al Jazeera English there. I mean, I'll, I'll turn this, I hope that answered your question, I'll turn it a little bit to um, Ukraine and, and Crimea. We have 10 teams. We have 10 teams. Okay, it probably is a couple of teams too many. But we have, Al Jazeera America has three teams. We have a person in Ukraine, a person in um, Simferopol, and another person in Sevastopol. Al Jazeera English has people in the same places and, and, and others. And then Al Jazeera Balkans and Al Jazeera Turkey both have people there. So when we cover a story, man, we cover the story. And what we have the advantage of, again, it's giving our American viewers something that I don't think they're getting anyplace else, is getting multiple strains on a story that you're not going to see on any other television news because we have this amazing content and, and these resources. Um, and we can, we can you know, sort of plaster a breaking news event with lots of people and take advantage of the folks who are already in the region. Kate, hi. Uh, I teach journalism at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. What's your name? Uh, Peter Tarr. Uh, I've been watching the channel. I don't think there's any doubt on the part of anyone who watches it uh, with any kind of an open mind that it's just wonderfully, it's a wonderful replacement for what some of the major networks used to do and don't do anymore. I, there's no question in my mind that your intentions are, com are completely above board and, and you know, 
you're striving for excellence. But of course, all of us also as, as journalists have had the experience that uh, where the money comes from is, is important. And, and it's not a question of your intent or what they've let you do. But is this, first of all, an endless stream of money from Qatar? I'm serious. I hope so. Well, but if <laughs> no, it is, then you know it, it's natural to ask: What is the? Why is the government of Qatar providing this wonderful service for Americans? Well, it's the government of Qatar is providing this wonderful service because they provided the same service globally and at the beginning um, in the Middle East. It, it is a decision that was made at the highest level. The I guess the former emir decided that he wanted to have this as part of, you know, frankly, I think it's part of all the various things that Qatar is doing as a government to broaden itself out in the, in the world. I, I'm not going to get into politics and geopolitics on that. Um, I will say that the freedom that we have is mirrored by the freedom that Al Jazeera English has and independence and the same thing for Al Jazeera Arabic. And so it's not just that you know we here in the U.S. want to make sure that we are editorially independent. There is a, a history of editorial independence at Al Jazeera that, um, frankly, I remember uh, reading about the um, during the Arab Spring when there were the the riots in Bahrain, and Al Jazeera was covering them, even though the government of Qatar was not so happy about those riots in Bahrain, but they were covering them at you know being as open as any Western. Um, news organization would be. So this is something that is not just about Al Jazeera America. I mean, I'm because we're new and I'm the first president, you know, I'm talking about it in terms of, of how I was hired. Um, but it, there is a, a long history of independence of, of the journalism. Well, it is a, it is a, um, they do not want it to be a money losing um, uh, entity. I think the perfect world would be if we could break even, um, but which I'm going for. I mean, Al Jazeera Media Networks also owns BN Sport, which is a hugely successful sports cable um, channel, a bunch of channels uh, around the world. So they have other arms of the same company that are making money that I think are offsetting any slow rise that, that we would have. Um, we've also made a very, some very specific decisions about um, our ad revenue, and it, to be honest, ad revenue is coming slowly. A lot, there are a lot of people who are in the ad advertising world who are skittish about the brand. I think that will, I think we will get over that, and we have. We have some very good. Um, there are a couple of very good advertisers who really have been with us from the beginning, um, but we will get to a point where we can, we can pay our own way. It will take a while. We've decided we're only doing six minutes of commercials an hour. Competition has 14 to 16 commercials of an hour, minutes of commercials an hour. So we very purposefully want to have more content. So that's, it's going to take a while for us to pay for everything through advertising revenue. But that's the goal. Hello, Malik. Uh, hello, Kate. Uh, Malik McCourt is my name. And, um, I uh, I know your dad, and uh, by the way, congratulations! I think uh, the, the station is fantastic. It, uh, my wife Diana and I watch it uh, much so religiously, and so that's well done. Uh, knowing your dad as I did, um, and he, I am to the left of Karl Marx, and. Uh, he was somewhat to the right of, uh, as you said, Genghis Khan. And we, we, we didn't agree on much at all, though. The only thing we agreed on was that there's no such thing as a large whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yeah. There were never enough. <laughs> But uh, him being there, and he was not, he was a very fair man, never mean-spirited like the right-wingers of today. He was a fair, decent kind of a man and, and great company. Now, growing up in that household, uh, would that have affected your philosophical outlook, and would you attempt to put that imprimatur on, this, on the network of Al Jazeera? Well, it's, that's an interesting question. Um, it affected me in as much as I listened to all sides. I did not have the same growing up, did not, as I guess most you know, children and teenagers, uh, I did not have the same political views that my parents had. 
Uh, but we lived in a house that was very news oriented, and they listened to all sides of everything. And you know, certainly my father, uh, even in his in his later years, and and um, he he died of Alzheimer's about 14 years ago. Um, he would just watch C-SPAN all day long because he wanted to get the information, more information, more information. So I think it's the 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 combination of more information, uh, hearing various viewpoints, and being able to acknowledge that there are various viewpoints in the world that has really informed who I am as a journalist and intense curiosity to find out what all the viewpoints and what, certainly what all the stories are. So I think that really, I mean, it, and by the way, my father did not encourage me or my sister to get into journalism, but man was he happy when we did. While, while you're pointing someone out for me, uh, Tell us what the Malaysian plane story is doing for your audience. Well, um, the combination of the Malaysian plane, the Ukrainian crisis, and what was going on in Venezuela has um, has really ticked up our ratings a lot in the last in the last few weeks. And we've done um, some special programming. We did you know a, a full night on on Ukraine last week. Um, we we have these. The fun thing about starting a network, for those of you who've, who've been in this world before, is that you get to experiment for, on things and figure out whether they work. It's really fun. Mary Ellen, I'm sure you remember what that was like. So we thought, hey, let's just do a half an hour on Malaysia, or let's just do in, in the middle of a news show, rather than you know a two-minute piece or a three-minute piece or whatever. And so we've really been able to do deep dives on some of these foreign stories, um, international stories, to stop saying foreign. Um, and I think that's, I think people are coming to us because of them, or maybe they're coming to us because they're seeing the ads, for whatever reason, they're staying, which is, which is really good. But interestingly, it's, it's also about how we're telling the stories, and I know that because we, we again, when we talk about doing things the Al Jazeera way, um, last November uh, for election night, it was off your election, but, but all the, cable news outfits were doing their election night coverage and they had, you know, a million screens and a lot of chirons and graphics and everything and people standing out in front of Chris Christie's um, headquarters and other places. And we decided to do the story in a very different way and, you know, we call it in the AJAM way where we utilized our 12 bureaus and added a couple of other places with some extra people and really told the story of various um, elections that would have impact on people. They weren't, you know, is Chris Christie going to be the new governor? They were, you know, all, all sorts of things. Of course, I'm not remembering any of them except for the marijuana one, which was, you know, in, in Colorado, but um, which a lot of other people did too. But we really did it in a very different way. We weren't that sort of breathless horse race kind of reporting. And we got a lot of viewers. And so we repeated that when we, when State of the Union um, came around this year, we said, you know what, let's do the same thing. We're, we're really going to go into all parts of the country where we have bureaus and talk about the issues with, with people, and also globally, because it's, whatever's going on in our country is, has an effect um, on the world. And so our coverage, not only did we have great guests, we had you know, Bill Richardson and Mac McClarty and the head of the Tea Party and you know, people sitting on set with us, but we also went to a guy who was in Cuba live um, because the Latin American uh, heads of state were having a meeting there. We had somebody live from Kabul because what goes on in our country has an effect certainly this year in Afghanistan. And where was the third place? There was a third place uh, where we were. I can't remember what, the, there was another story that was going on at the same time. So we do things in a very different way from the competition and what we're noticing is that that, in addition to covering foreign news, I think is bringing in viewers. Oh, the kicker was our ratings on State of the Union night, 700 times improvement. 700% improvement over what we had. Which means that people are looking for a different way, I think, of covering big stories like that. Kate, I'm Betsy Ashton, um, uh, formerly of CBS News, currently a big supporter of public broadcasting, uh, which tries to do what you're talking about but doesn't have anywhere near the funding. Uh, I will tell you that gets me back to the question that some people have already raised, which is about, and, and I'm very encouraged by what I'm hearing today. I haven't seen you yet in, uh, on air, but I'm very encouraged about everything I'm hearing. Um, 
the question always goes back to who's paying the bills. And is it possible? Is it just, you know, we think of Al Jazeera, we think, okay, the peninsula, we think of a, a political group that is trying to get a pro-Arab, uh, a different kind of viewpoint around in the world. On the other hand, uh, what I'm hearing you saying is there's been no interference. We also know that m big media means big power. Is it possible that there are individuals who are funding this, who are on the order of the individuals who launched, you know, the Bill Paley's of this world, who stood up to big power, who were able to gather the information, and when push came to shove, when somebody got it to them, you know, uh, basically said, we're going with the story. That obviously, I don't know that that's happened yet, but what do you know about the source of the money, who that person is or persons, what, um, what level of education do they have, and what is their worldview, if you know? Well, the source of the money is the government of Qatar, and the folks who are running the, the government of Qatar are highly educated. I've met a few of them. Highly, highly educated and worldly. Um, the folks I've met have lived either uh, in Texas, because it's oil country, and, uh, or in Europe, in London. Um, there, I, th I believe, based on my conversations with them, that they are very worldly group of people. I haven't met everybody. I haven't met the Emir, for example. Um, but there is a, a very, very, very thick wall between the business side and the editorial side. That is true in Al Jazeera Arabic and Al Jazeera English and Al Jazeera Turk and Balkans um, as it is in ours. I mean, truly, it, it, unlike, and those of you who have been in, in network news before, you know that the president is in, you know, a lot of stuff rolls up to the president, like advertising sometimes and, and marketing and PR and legal and things like that. That doesn't happen here. They literally keep a, a, a wall between the business side of the business and the editorial. Now, do we talk to each other? Sure, we talk to each other. We have to talk to each other. You know, we are, in, in essence, the client for all of those people. But there, it's a 20-year it's a, a history of keeping the business side away from the editorial side. So I'm not sure how better to explain. And we haven't had, I mean, honestly, we haven't had a, a story yet, I'm sure we will, where we have to stand up to power. But I mean, the stories that we, frankly, if they're not going to squawk about stories about, you know, workers in Qatar, you know, what, what's the story that's going to get, you know, a, a question from those guys? I mean, it, it's very, very, very much in the code of, conduct, code of conduct that everybody has to sign who works for Al Jazeera um, and in the plan for Al Jazeera Media Networks from the beginning that editorial is separate from, from business. Uh, Mike Levitas, the New York Times. We, we are, in Israel, analogous to uh, Al Jazeera in reporting on the Middle East. So my question is this. Every Times reporter has had mixed feelings, as to put it mildly, about its reception in the Times reporting on Israel. Following your, your statement and hands, Question. Could you explain why, I mean, what, what it is about Al Jazeera that uh, has stricken, shocked the Arab government in that country? Certainly in the United States of America, with the freest press in the world has the worst relations with its government, a liberal government, as you well know. Has Al Jazeera run afoul of any Muslim government in the Middle East? And a few examples would help. Well, I, as I said before, the government in Bahrain, um, uh, I'm the government of Egypt, that's, you know. The well, Egypt is not 
a Muslim government. It's an anti-Muslim government. It's an it's a population. But, and but what the coverage that, that Al Jazeera English was doing was neither pro or anti. It was just telling the story. So that government did not like the story that was being told, therefore threw people in jail. Um, there have been plenty of examples, Bahrain is the one that, I, that comes to mind you know, first, of Arab governments that have not been happy with um, the coverage that Al Jazeera has done. Certainly, certainly in the years of Al Jazeera Arabic, um, Tunisia wasn't so happy with the, the coverage of the original you know, self-immolation and, and then you know, rising, uprising in, in Tunisia. That government wasn't happy. They got toppled. So there have been lots of governments in the Middle East who have not been happy with Al Jazeera's coverage. At, um, ever since, uh, Kate, it's Alan. I'm back here. Hi. Ever since uh, the people from the New York Times heard that uh, they're the Al Jazeera of print, they've been determined to pack this audience. So I have another New York Times guy <laughs> in a row who wants to ask a question. Hi, Kate. Ralph Blumenthal. I was Hi. at the Times. Um, I watched your coverage last night of Flight 370, and I flipped back and forth between CNN and MSNBC. Um, I wasn't particularly uh, impressed by your report, and I noticed that they had more talking heads and aviation experts than you did. Uh, I'd like to ask you, how do you feel you've distinguished yourselves, if, if you have, with the Malaysian Airlines coverage, and do you have a problem getting experts to come on your program compared to the networks? Well, we just asked Warren Hogg. He usually shows up. Um, uh, how do I think we've done? I think we've fits and starts a little bit with the Malaysian story um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think we've done well in that we had people there uh, because there is a bureau in Kuala Lumpur um, from, for Al Jazeera English. Uh, so there were people there from the get-go. So I think we had a jump on a lot of the American news networks who had to get there. Um, uh, and there were a lot of people on the ground there and in Beijing um, that that were reporting the story. Uh, I think, I mean, la it's interesting <laughs> that you should say this because a couple of, uh, well, this story has been going on for 10 days. So last week, a couple of times we had some very good people on our air, um, experts, who then literally after they left our air were called by CNN or NBC or CBS and were, were given contracts to be consultants to keep them away from anybody else. Um, so yes, we do have a little bit of, of an uphill, uphill climb with that. Um, there are people who will not come on our air um, because of the name and their, their assumptions about who we are. But they're getting fewer and fewer. It's really interesting to see who who winds up talking to us. Last night we had Carolyn Maloney and Wesley Clark and oh man, who was the person in the middle? Um, good, well-known names who had who had expertise. Um, Marianne Schiavo is that her name? The former FAA um, woman was on our air, and then CNN hired her like the next day. So. You know, we have, you know, it's, it's in some ways, it's, there's an Al Jazeera aspect to it, but also there's a competitive nature of people in this business, and they're just going to be picking people off. Hey, uh, CNN, uh, Bill Field, ABC News, radio. CNN pretty much went wall to wall on this. Their ratings have spiked. There's a story in the Times today by Bill Carter. Uh, did you ever think you might go that way? Uh, go wall to wall with that kind of coverage saying hey this is like great time to cover this kind of a story constantly and uh, people are turning to CNN because they figure if that plane lands somewhere either in the twilight zone or something and Rod Serling is there who knows what's going to happen but what's what's the feeling over at Al Jazeera? We didn't think about going wall to wall in that way um, and we didn't want to be sort of breathless speculation about where the where the plane was going to come down. I've I've seen and heard a lot of things on some of the other channels that I would not approve on our air. Pardon me. Um, we have increased. It, it's certainly a story that we have increased the the number of minutes on in every one of our broadcasts. Um, 
But there's other stuff going on, too. It's, it's not the only story. And just as and we got a lot of crazy press that, you know, oh, Al Jazeera didn't do the Justin Bieber arrest. We did, <laughs> we did do the Justin Bieber arrest, but we did it in its appropriate place. It was a tell. It wasn't a story. It wasn't an hour like one of our competitors. Um, we told it the, in the appropriate place. So we, we really look at things globally, and that includes the U.S., and we want to tell this all the stories that we think are important. And in my opinion, being 24-7 breathless on a story that includes speculation is not who we are. It's just not. Nothing new. Well, yeah. Martin Kandel, formerly of CNN. You mentioned the 700% increase in viewership when you did that uh, coverage of the State of the Union. Now, you probably picked up 100 new viewers right in this room. Great. Uh, Seven hundred percent tomorrow. But if you're extremely low, mm -hmm. it doesn't take a lot of new viewers to get up seven hundred percent. Thank you for bursting that bubble. Yeah. <laughs> My question to you is: Does it discourage your people that so few viewers are watching? Um, no, to be honest. People who came to Al Jazeera America came to Al Jazeera America because they knew the kind of journalism we were going to be doing and we're completely cognizant of what it's like to be in a startup and and you know how long it takes um, we do have a small but growing number I mean you know half a million people watch us every day there the New York Post was quoted ages ago as saying oh you only get 10,000 people which is not actually true <laughs> it's actually much more than that um, so I don't get discouraged. I don't think our people get discouraged because we constantly meet people like some of you in this room who say, it, you're doing a really good job. It's terrific. It will catch on. We have really seen, I mean, it's amazing. We are only six and a half months old. We have seen an amazing anecdotal um, explosion in, in people finding us and liking us and maybe not liking some things. You know, we're not perfect. As I said at the beginning, we, I'm so proud of what we've done thus far. We have ages to go before, and I don't think you're ever, you ever get perfect, but ages to go before I'll, I will feel like, oh, okay, every show, every minute is as good as I want it to be. So it's, it's long. I mean, if you go back and compare it to the beginning of CNN, it was 11 years before it was rated. Um, MS you know, took a couple of years. Fox took a couple of years. I'm reading the, uh, the book about Roger Ailes, and it's very interesting to see what decisions they made at the beginning about do we rate, do we not rate, do we tell people how, you know, nobody's watching us. So it, that's a little bit of a, in my opinion, sort of a false measure of what we're doing at this point. I really am going much more on, on you know, what impact do we have? Are our stories getting out there? Are people seeing what we are doing? And are we increasing? If, if our ratings were going like this, I'd be worried. Even if, they're, if the numbers are small, I'd be worried. But they're not. They're, they're doing this. Yes. My name is Phil Zweig, a former Business Week, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, a bunch of places. Um, as you're talking, I'm reminded of a interview I had with Walter Riston, the former late chairman of Citicorp years ago for my biography on him, and um, he was telling me about a visit he made to Saudi Arabia around 1975 where he met with the then king. I can't remember which one it was, the one who was assassinated by his nephew or something. And Riston was in, in Saudi to talk about uh, uh, Citibank's uh, banking operations, but the king uh, only wanted to talk about the bad press that the uh, Saudis and the Arab world was getting in the United States. And uh, Riston suggested, well, you got the money, why don't you buy the International Herald Tribune? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the king says, ah, we're, we're not in the newspaper business, we don't want to be in the newspaper business. Um, so it it's now seems to me that 40 years later, uh, along comes um, Al Jazeera, and I, I find it hard not to believe that somehow the underlying an underlying purpose is to present a more benign, perhaps fair, more objective view of um, the Arab world in the United States. 
Um, I'm also curious what your long-term return on equity goal is. I mean, you're, you're doing this for one or two things, either to communicate what you believe to be a fairer, more objective view of the Arab world and or to make money. And I'm, I'm curious what your uh, long-term profitability goal is. Um, well, I, I did address the, the profitability question, which is we do want to break even. I mean, it'd be nice if we made money, but I'm looking at breaking even. Um, and that's a long-term goal because I think we're a ways away from that right now. Uh, in terms of our other goals, well, first of all, Saudi Arabia did create its own television network. It's called Al Arabiya, and it is run by Saudi government. Uh, and that was created after Al Jazeera actually started, Al Jazeera Arabic. It is not my intention to your, to what you said, to uh, create a more fair and balanced view of Arabs or of the Middle East. I want to create a more fair and, bal fair and balanced view of the entire world. I think there's a lot that's not known about other cultures and other countries that Americans need to know. And as long as we can give all opinions and we can tell the story in a 360 degree way, then I think we will have done our job. It just happens to be that we are owned by the government of a country in the Middle East. That in some ways is immaterial to our editorial focus. Our editorial focus is to tell the stories that are underreported from around the world, make people think about news, make people think about the world in a way that I don't think that they are getting the opportunity to do with other um, news channels right now. Okay. Thank you so much. That was absolutely terrific. I want to, the Board of Governors, you're the first one to receive this. I hope it doesn't go against the conflict of interest rules at Al Jazeera. But for real news people, we've decided if they're kind enough to tell us what's going on in their world, we would like to make them a member of the Society of the Silurians for oh, a year. Nice. So you're the, you're the first person to. Thank you very much. That's great. So we're, we're very happy to do that. and. Uh, I must say, I'm, uh, I am, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, feel quite assured hearing the boss talk about a network that has sort of been a mystery. And I, I, it's like, if the captain of the Exxon Valdez had to go in public, would he have crashed the boat? I don't think so. <laughs> you have a big vessel you're moving, is what I mean. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you're doing it very skillfully, and I think you're going to have a big impact from this room outward. So thank you again for being with us.